like we are ready. Uh, can everybody hear me pretty good? Yeah. Great afternoon, world. My name is DJ Quest Coast um, from Los Angeles, California. I'm a serial entrepreneur, DJ, uh, artist, producer. Uh, produce a lot of festivals in the city of Los Angeles. And uh, I've been a long time cannabis uh, consumer advocate. And uh, I am a social equity entrepreneur. Uh, I was uh, fortunate to be selected upon the, uh, the recent round of retail in Los Angeles as a 33 round one recipient for a retail operation. Um, so I'm excited about that and I'm launching my cannabis store and my cannabis brand and I'm going to change the face of my family with this right here. So I'm just grateful. I'm sitting on the stage with uh, an accomplished group of individuals. Uh, two beautiful women and another brother uh, sitting immediately to my right. Uh, sister originally from Oakland. Um, she is actually, um, she has an amazing podcast called Highly Political, and she's also a member of Canaclusive. Give it up for Tiana Jones. <laughs> also, right to her right, um, this brother's a master grower, and he's a cultivator manager at Smartweed. And he also has a brand himself. It's called Ghost Society. So give it up for my brother, Abel Tafar I. And um, all the way to the end, she is such a, a beautiful pillar in the community. Just filled with passion and just uh, so much education. And you just want to get behind her when she's moving because we're going places, y'all. Kika Keith is the founder of Gorilla RX as well as the co-founder of the Social Equity Owners and Workers Association, and I'm a proud founder member of as well. So give it up for Ms. Keith. Keith. Mm -hmm. Yeah, today uh, we are live in the middle of the commercialization of cannabis. We want to understand. He said legalize cannabis, and, and we got a medical of cannabis, and we got a dope use. But really what we're seeing is the commercialization of cannabis turning into a commodity, which we always knew it was, but now it's here. we got science to back it up. The policies are slow. The regulations don't me necessarily measure the, uh, the actual uh, full intent of some of these programs are set out to do. And, you know, can we just talk about some of the history of, of cannabis and, and how we get to the end of a almost century long prohibition? Any, any one of you guys can take it, you know? Okay. <laughs> you know, um, we all know the history in our communities, right? I don't need to go in from Nixon into the war on drugs and the assault that was made on our community to here in South Central LA when the FBI was bringing crack cocaine and all that that led to you know, to me, when I speak about the war on drugs, I like to humanize the damage that has been done in our community. You know, when we look in the city of Los Angeles, when we represent 9% of the population, yet 40% of the arrests and convictions, that's the problem. And then the residual effects of that, because those mothers and fathers that went away or were killed on the streets, they left their children in foster care. And in Los Angeles, black children have the highest rate by far in foster care. So when we start looking at those effects, when we look at the educational system, the, the collateral damages, why our black men can't get jobs because they have these felonies on their records and how that disseminates the black family, that's the war on drugs. I like to speak of the effects on the war on drugs so that we understand the importance why when this is legal, when we still got our brothers and sisters locked up, where it is our responsibility to partake and get these licenses, which is the generational wealth. We gotta pass those licenses down. It should not be where we want to roll up to these other corporations. Our legacy and responsibility to the blood that was shed on our streets from our family members has to be to acquire the wealth in order to rebuild and reinvest in our communities. And that's part of what I like to speak about in terms of cannabis and effects and why it's so important in our history within it. I told you she's on fire, y'all. <laughs> 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 Either one of you want to chime in on it? Just to kind of speak to what Kiko was saying, I think another thing that's interesting about the cannabis uh, history is the legalization of it, and that kind of goes hand in hand with the, the war on drugs, and it's still interesting to me that there's still such a stigma in this country, uh, even within this state where it's legal, um, that people really have a, a negative thought and viewpoint about people that do like cannabis and what cannabis actually do. 
That's so true. I mean, I don't even like to use the word stigma anymore because we just need to normalize what, what it is. I mean, it's normal to see somebody smoking a cigarette now, right? You don't think, oh my gosh, they're smoking a cigarette. Or even having a beer, you can have a beer at a restaurant with your family, and it's okay. So, and that could be way more damaging than cannabis could be, right? But the smell and the, all of these wise tales, I think when you start to look at the, the, the sheer fact of how prohibition just lied to the country for just a century about how it's not medicinal, hasn't it? It's, it's a Schedule One drug that has no medicinal value. I think that's criminal in itself. So we let people perish and we know how people utilize this plant. A lot of people say, oh, I smoke recreational every day. I like to say, you probably smoke to something inside of your body and you're bringing your body back to homeostasis if we just start to understand our uh, endocannabinoid system. So we're not smoking recreationally, you're smoking to keep from maybe blowing up on something or fighting the world or dealing with pain or Actually, law and 
you know, it started in Oakland and it's happening. It's in California. So now we have it in Los Angeles. I'm a social equity recipient. Keith is a social equity recipient. We have another social equity recipient from uh, uh, when he's in the pipeline to get one. We call it into existence, you know, uh, in Long Beach. But my question to you is, is what, what is social equity? What is that? Anybody? What you say social equity? study on it better and educate myself better. And you know what I so, you know, my parents they didn't really understand that they were against it. You know, look down and you know, when people say like, oh you can't really do anything now. Medicate, you know, you're lazy, you can't do stuff. But I decided as, as a culture aspect, I decided to change for them. So you know it made me more drive and made me more educated and you know I went to college at the same time got my degree got my degree. Never would I thought I'd be a massive grower and get, you know, a paycheck now and, you know Affirmative action, because without affirmative action, we can't 
do anything for black people specifically in policy, right? You can't do anything specifically for a particular group based on affirmative action being illegal now and unconstitutional. So we all know that we are the largest group affected by the war on drugs, the black and brown community, 80%. Easy. Um, to me, it's a policy that clearly creates a pathway for those in particular groups, I'm saying black and brown, but because of affirmative action, we can't say that. So marginalized groups who've been affected by the war on drugs to get systemic, uh, listen, listen to this, it's really simple to this, four words, a pathway to get systemic, institutionalized, economic autonomy. We want that forever. You owe us that. Ain't nothing else to talk about. We want the clear pathway to do it because we can serve ourselves. We can do it ourselves. We know we can. Now we just need the tools back to do it. That can come in so many different ways. But it's not like when we think about social equity, it's like we need a cookie cutter contract. We know we don't because we're all unique. So your contract is only different to mine, too. You know what I'm saying? You might get a better contract than me just based on how great you are, right? Or whatever you bring to the table or where your store is. So many different factors, it's not a cookie cutter situation. You gotta carve this shit out for you. Because if whatever you've been doing your whole life is transferable in legal care. And I will. You can take us home on that. <laughs> well, um, I just think the simple definition of, of equity is to give an advantage to those that were disadvantaged, right? And so when we look at identifying who that is in cannabis, then we do know, as Quest said, that's black and brown people, but more specifically, black people. You know, we were disproportionately um, affected four times more than any other um, racial group. And so, you know, to me, it is giving that group or those group of people an advantage. And how do we do that? Well, in this industry, you got to have access to capital. You have to have education. You have to know how to do the licensing and compliance. All of those things that create a disadvantage to us over those white billionaires that are in this game, those are the things that either the city or the community should be providing to the group that is interested in the ownership opportunities. That's one. That's social equity. But I always say it really should be racial equity. And as Quest said, we haven't been able to do the racial part as we should, justly do. It's about the effects of the war on drugs. We cannot use that measure. But what we can do is reflect it in the program, the social equity program. And the tenants in Los Angeles and it goes across the board to the United States. It's not just in the licensing opportunities, but it is also in the mandate that the tax revenues that are created that goes to the city in Los Angeles over the past three years since 2018, the city of Los Angeles has collected $330 million in tax revenues. What? $41 million went to the cannabis regulation, but $289 million went to the general fund. Who got that money? We didn't, right? And so Sir, there becomes a demand. Not only they did it for the first California first five with the, with the cigarette tax, right? There are, are tools that are in place, precedents that is set, where there can be a mandate where these tax dollars, and that was a part of Measure M that was passed in 2017, Sir. the Cannabis Tax Act, was to give a provision and resolution for social equity and social justice, yeah. right? That's the effects of the war on drugs in our communities, and it's supposed to impact the communities. So we have to recognize that, that it is not just fighting for the licenses, but it's also fighting for the job creation. These are living wage jobs. We are all starting at the ground floor. If you know these regulations, you can move up in these dispensaries, cultivation facilities, manufacturing, distribution, testing facilities. You can move from entry level to management. I'm talking about within a year if you just study the regulations because everybody is starting from the same playing field. I don't care if you've been in the industry for 25 years. You don't know how to operate in the compliant industry and it is completely different. So I start the same as the guy that started 25 years ago when it comes to how to operate that business. Now, he can keep doing the creative part, but I can slip in and do the business operations, and that's what allows you to stay in business. So I say it to my black people. They're going to confuse us with all these other classes and programs. Study the regulations and go to these city meetings. 
because at the city meetings, they discuss things that don't make it to the record and don't make it to the regulations. But you're going to find out where the green real estate zones are at because they're debating it in that meeting. You're going to get the heads up because you got to have property in order to apply. You're going to get your whole game plan in those meetings. And then you don't got to worry about predatory investors because you know more than they know. When you're sitting at the table negotiating, you negotiate from a position of power. And all it takes is just taking the time. We got to create the equity, right? The laws are in place. But we can't, if we don't pull it back, they will brush us by. We will be left out like the tobacco, the cotton industry, alcohol yeah, industry, industry, every industry, you name it. We are not, we don't got no damn share of the market. And currently, y'all, we only represent less than 2% of all the licenses across the United States. So that's, if that's an issue, that we have to take the mantle, take the responsibility to learn and grow and be a part of it and fight for it. Because if we don't t turn up to these city council meetings and say, nah, uh you got to put that tax reinvestment back on there. nah, uh you said 100 licenses, not 25. nah, uh you said we were going to go before those multi-state operators. If we don't hold them accountable, once again, we will be left out. So these are just my words of encouragement to get busy, be a part of it, even if you don't want to be a part of the licensing. If you're an accountant, I can't tell you how many folks need accountant services. It doesn't change. It's a consumer good. If you're a security guard, you can start your own security business. In LA, it's about to be 200 new retail licenses opening up. If you're into construction, HVAC systems, electrical, go build out all these dispensaries that are coming up. It is a prime market. There are no experts, and we have the opportunity as creative and brilliant and geniuses that we are. We have the opportunity to take a fair share of this cannabis industry across the United States and globally. Because if you look around, y'all, it ain't just here, Barbados, Jamaica, Trinidad, wherever we got people, farms, real estate all over this country, somewhere in our family we do. We got to start tracking it, form groups in the community that we can start educating ourselves and be a part of this process in this industry. Because it is an international industry. Yeah, my point is, I don't like, I don't believe that earlier, like, when I got in there, it gave me an advantage. It's like I understand, I kept up to date with the technology that was happening within the uh, growing aspect. So like traditionally, like we would do it by hand, but now we do it automation. So I stayed up to that. I would have meetings with like high the store owners and say, "Hey, if I had this setup, how would I go about it?" So when I even got that interview with the job, I was like, "Look, you guys are still doing it hand watering. I can upgrade this whole place for you. You know exactly what you guys will need, and at the same time, it's going to save you a lot of manpower, a lot of hours that can be dedicated into like giving your clients more attention they'll need." which will upgrade, like, decrease your yield by 20-30%. And it's exactly what happened in the six months' time. So, like, being able to do that now would give me that leverage and advantage to go out to other places and be a consultant for other dispensaries, other people starting up. And, you know, at this age, it's like, I run into people that have been in the industry longer than me. They don't know the legal side of it. You know, they don't know the rules as far as the seat to sell track system that's metric. They just know exactly how you got to go about it and do it because you got to stay compliant. So other people just like, no, I know this, I got more experience. But, like, yeah, you might have more experience, but you're not as educated. So having that gives you an upgrade and a leverage that you got to just stay detailed on it. Absolutely. Brother, you got a question?
sharing information and resources. That's simple. And I did not gotta charge you to tell you about who you should use for whatever part of your process. And so what we've been just doing is creating best practices, brother, as we go. Um, no, there is not a, a step-by-step -step guide, but we have a step-by-step -step until we got to this point. We had to file a lawsuit against the city of Los Angeles a year and a half ago because they, of their flawed system. We want a settlement for a 100 additional retail licenses at time opening my store on Crenshaw right next to Maverick Sweat. And so there are blueprints of how we need to organize. We have blueprints of what we need to learn. And then if you're going for licenses, you can talk one-on-one -on -one with, with some folks on our team that kind of just guide you on that step of what you need. Um, for now, it is just the cannabis industry because y'all see how fast it's sparking up across this country. We are on a time clock, right? Because these cities are opening up and they only have one window for licensing, right? And then they might not open it up again for another five years and you miss the first mover right, the first to market opportunity. So we are focusing, but eventually uh, our effort is to go across the equity board. We're demanding equity in every area, but we're just starting here. Because social equity technically is a, is a hybrid business model. If you, if you think about it from just a business perspective, you can apply this to a coffee shop. You can apply this to a clothing store. We're talking about access to being able to start a business and get equity and run your own shit. That's what we're looking at. So. It can go across. There was a question. Yes. Now, you said the SEO on this time, right? Okay. Yes, that's S E O W A. And that's the Social Equity Owners and Workers Association. SEO was, it would be like to say. Another question right in the front. So, what about for people who were in the legacy market before and, you know, built up whatever amount of cash or whatever How do you transition into the quote unquote legal market without snitching? That's a good question right there. I, I, I'm going to jump in real quick. Can so, you repeat the question, please? Yeah, no doubt. The question was, is if you're in a legacy market, how do you transition from the legacy market into the legal space without snitching on yourself? And the first thing I would say is just uh, pick, pick your position in the industry. you got to first know when you're going to start, right? If you got some money in your pocket and you can go grab all the licenses, then that might be a lot better. If you are undercapitalized and you're trying to figure out, you said he had a little money too. The first step I would do is, is I would start with my product. If you already have a product, I would do a brand, right? You don't need a license to do a brand. You just need a distributor to distribute your product. You're purchasing product. You're, uh, they're white labeling their product to you. And you're just putting your name on it like you would do a pharmaceutical or a nutraceutical or a, uh, a t-shirt. It's the same concept, right? So that's that would be like an easy, low-hanging fruit where you don't need a license. But um, the first thing, like she keeps saying, you have to start with understanding the regulations or get with somebody who does understand the regulations because you have to figure out where you want to transition into. So if you want to grow, you know, there's no grow license available in Los Angeles right now. So are you looking outside of the area? You, yeah, possibly, because you can't get one in Los Angeles unless you partner with somebody who already has a license and that's just purpose of a business, buying into a business, things of that nature. I think the low hanging fruit for equity brands though is if, if they already have market share, I watch a lot of folks brand the product and put the product on the shelf and go get stored because you already have brand equity. So that's an easy low hanging fruit. Get you some capital up and then you can go acquire that license. Yeah. Um, I, I would just say to there is not a pathway, unfortunately, for the legacy operators. Um, they deliberately did that. I remember in 2017 when I was stopping at City Hall and was like, where is the outreach? How come the people have these dispensaries? How come they're not understanding on how to go about turning these their places into licensed shops? And they deliberately did not outreach. They deliberately did not educate. They did deliberately did not create materials or go even to these places before they started shutting them down and saying, here goes a step guy, come to our workshops at the city of LA and learn how we, we want your tax dollars, go through these steps. And so there has not been that effort anywhere around this country. Um, and at, for the little bit that we hope to do, and I say this not as a plug, because we don't get paid, I've never charged nobody for no classes, I've never, I've never asked for no equity or no shares. So I say this to extend our hand to as many possible people and as many people possible. <laughs> um, 
um, like developmentgroup.org, um, we can at least guide you down that road because there is a pathway. Um, they just hide it from us. And as Quest said, it does begin from the regs. But if you look at them and see 140 pages and might be like reading the King James Version where everything is all scrambled up with the this and the thous and you got security on page 9, 37, and 105 instead of having it all in one section, um, that's what we can at least help guide you through the understanding. Once you got the understanding that it's, you're, you're off to the races after that. Well, it, it depends which license, right? Your lowest barrier to entry is a delivery license that could cost you from 300000 to half a million. Um, you have your cultivation licenses. I know we have a micro business in downtown LA. We're in $1.8 million already, and it's still not enough. Um, my retail dispensary over here, I'm looking at about a $1.1 million budget to build it out. And the fact that I've been renting this place for three years, empty. Um, and that will happen in this licensing process, right? That's another thing. They're not prioritizing us like they should. So you'll be sick. you have to have a property to apply. And then there is no sort of framework on for social equity. They need to be out of this process in six months. So that's the other thing. You know, these large white corporations, they bought the real estate. So they can keep holding on to it a year or two years, right? It's still appreciated in their value. Um, so it's those things that we just have to be aware of. But you're talking about a substantial amount of money. But once again, in most of these cities, folks can't get in unless they are connected to a social equity applicant. So we do have the ability to, to raise capital. I raised a million dollars for my um, for my business. Um, I had one investor that I met early on, and I pretty much had a share proper deal. Um, and then after I was able to break through from that deal, it took me... Um, I raised 12, I raised about 370 at 12 and a half percent, right? I valued my company at $3 million. And it was a sister that ended up investing early on. And then that helped me get other investors because I was like, I really don't need your money. You know what I mean? And so then that put me in a position to get an experienced operator and I raised the rest. And then maybe it took me about a five to six month period of time. I'm sorry. Um, no, I, I sold straight equity. I didn't want to have any debt, and, and I liked my $3 million valuation. I was happy with that. But the convertible note is a, uh, a nice strategic way that we're seeing pop up. It's a blanket agreement where you can offer somebody a debt instrument, and then they can transfer the equity based on how you pay them back over a period of time. So uh, one of the biggest issues, because she said she threw it out there, I had a $3 million valuation. Well, one of the issues that we're having is, is uh, well, how do you properly value your company when it's no profit and loss? Right? You don't have no financials. The real business people say, ah, oh, you're not a business, you're an idea. You know? And so now you have a conflict of proving your value in the space. You can tell Keith don't have no issue with brand equity. She got that because what, what she's been doing. I had to look at myself. Well, what have you been doing? And you're a DJ. You've been producing all these festivals around town. You built up a, a nice production company. People actually sought you out for DJ work. That's brand equity. You might be an accountant. You might be the baddest tax person. You might, whatever it is, right? That brand equity transfers over into this industry because this is a business like any other business. And, you know, that's so important that we kind of recognize that how to properly value ourselves. Because they're going to come and try to be us, right? And if you don't understand the regulations, if you don't understand the policy, if you don't have no proper civic engagement, we have a challenge. We're, we're traumatizing our community because when I, I just see the police, I get anxiety. I just see them. I thought I was having a nightmare yesterday. I was driving downtown, and I saw this Netflix thing on TV, and it was like this crazy loop of some police brutality. And I was like, why is this even on TV? But I saw it in real life. I'm driving four police car, uh, police in one car, driving around. They follow me around the block. I think they follow me. It's the Lakers game. <laughs> They're Lakers security today. They just going around. But I'm driving around about to pick somebody up. I'm nervous. They follow me. Oh, Lord, oh, what am I going to do? And um, I leave there. I go to a, a restaurant to eat, walk in. Four more police officers. I'm like, oh, shit. 
I get anxiety just to this So the point was is this. We're traumatized just by police brutality, by the war on drugs, just by our engagement with cops. So when you think about what you said, legacy going into legal and not snitching on yourself, where do you think the trauma lies there? Where do you think somebody who, who actually is making money and being able to provide for their family, even though it's in the gray area, because it's not the black market no more, it's the gray area or the legacy market, right? Um, how do you think his trauma is dealing with trying to get legal or her trauma to get with it. And so that is a, a piece that just the, the mental therapy that we need to go through social equity, we found that coming together as a group and just coming because we, we realize that you go through all of the ranges of emotion when you, somebody's coming at you knowing you have a multi-million dollar asset at the table and he's telling you it's not worth anything. But he wants to invest in it, and he's telling you how he cared about social equity, you know. And, and, and they want to, but, but they're sitting there with it, what we call it the, the share proper agreement, you know. And so that's that is a challenge that we have to kind of like really bond together and really understand how to navigate that with emotional intelligence, because you can't you can't scream in that room, you know. You gotta be you gotta be calm and collected. You gonna say something? You know, it just made me think of the importance of like you mentioned working with the local. shifting earlier we need to raise your initial money for your real estate and for your license application through your friends and family your valuation changes once you already have that paperwork that you're being processed right so that's actually how I was able to go back and raise that million dollars differently than the first time around when I needed that investor to get my property he was calling all the shots right but then after that when he left then I was in position. I knew I was going to get licensed. I was one of the, the 200. And then I had had a property. So early stages, two things. This is a political game and it's a real estate game. Don't think you can play without having the real estate identified. Don't listen to all these social equity programs. The next round is about to be another round of 125 licenses, 150, 150 retail licenses, if you have a cannabis conviction or arrest. It is coming up by the end of the year that you can qualify for a lottery. They're going to tell you you don't need a property in order to apply. I'm telling you, start building those relationships. Talk to your aunts and your uncles and your great aunts and uncles. They probably have a commercial property somewhere in the city of L.A. The county of L.A. will be coming next. Long Beach is coming up. Um, that is are the two things that you have to do. Become a grassroots lobbyist and get that real estate locked down because when you have that, and you're talking to the investors, you're in a different position. And if you had enough money with your friends and family to give that real estate a deposit, because you're not ready to move in yet, hold it for me, go through that licensing process, pay your first ten, fifteen thousand dollars in licensing fees. The city says, okay, you're ready to go and your property is approved, approved, then you go to your investors because then you can legitimately say you have a two or three million dollar valuation. Um, pre having that that opportunity 
pre-having the real estate and then you have to go and ask the investor to give you the real estate, you lose all of your power in that negotiation. So those are two things I would really say to harness on early stages um, and, and going after these licenses. Yeah, that's huge. That's huge right there. I know so many people want to know, like, how do I just start a cannabis business? You know, you give a few different pieces you've been dumping around and whatnot. Uh, but I think it's really important to identify where you want to be in the space, right? You got to identify where you want to be. If you want to grow, great. That's a whole list of work over there. Because if you, if you think about uh, uh, vertical integration, that's another buzzword. Shouts out to Ned Puzzle, right? Um, that's literally starting a multitude of businesses all at the same time. You know, cultivation being one, manufacturing, distribution, retail delivery, and it's going to be other businesses that are going to have to work with those businesses that you're probably going to start to maintain your business. So you're starting about a dozen businesses. If you want to be bird seed to sale, understand that part, right? So that's a big undertaking. It's and this is not about you as a licensee. It becomes bigger than you because now you're building a system, and you don't build that system around you. Because if you like, if you can't be there. You be like a barber, like you know, you don't want to be a barber in this situation. You want to be a barber shop, right? Shop is always open. Any barber can come in. You're building a system. So look at it that way. Um, yeah, this is a great conversation. I want to before I go right here. I want to know if we have any questions in the audience. Because I know we have a virtual audience out there. I want to send a shout out to you guys for watching us. Any questions? Just tap them in the chat, and we'll definitely uh, love to include you all in the conversation as well. We have a question right here in the front, though. Um, so, you're talking about buzzwords, and I think that the health benefits of cannabis has kind of gotten to like a new level of buzz or whatever. But I think also, again, bring it back to the culture, things like weed and, and music and celebrity, everybody's smoking exotic, right? And part of me feels like exotics are not good for you. Can we talk a little bit about like the plant, how it's evolved now? It's not like a massive drug you question know what I'm right saying? here. That like the big. I mean, the whole aspect of exotics is just a label that was just thrown to these plants that just not your typical. For me, back then, it was just everyone wanted OG. You know, and it's just every. And what does OG stand for? Uh, yeah. Anybody out there? I just thought it was just throw out there. Okay. 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 Yeah. <laughs> what did you say? Original gangster. See, y'all too street, man. If it's a weed world, it's old shit. Grown. It was grown by the ocean. Ocean grown. So, oh. yeah, but I mean, our. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's outside. Yeah, it's outside. <laughs> 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 oh, you probably going to get it too. I'm going to grow it. It's all love, man. This is why we do it. We share it. Yeah. No, but back then, it was just like, the risk exotics to me back then were like, say, 2009, 2012 time was like green tea. You know, what that girl's got to do. Uh, stuff like that, you know, but you don't see. Too much of those anymore. And everyone's just transitioning as time goes on. But it's really just when you get a good genetic. When you get something that's just like, you know, a good purple string, and then you just cross it at the same time, and a name thrown on it and stuff, and you're like, oh, this looks like it's exotic. You know what I'm saying? Runts, like the straight runts where I hear all the time, you know, or truffles and stuff, like this is just, you know, someone that got that string, and it's not shared around with a lot of other growers and stuff. And they just keep it super exclusive, and they're, that's what cookies are. You know, you can't get certain cookies, like no one else can really grow that strain but they give out the seeds. And you get the seeds through crossbreeding, you know? So it's just it's a whole like science behind it and everything, but it's not, the thing that's unhealthy is when pesticides being used or other things being used towards a plant that shouldn't really be in there to enhance the growth. You know, you gotta really let it do its own life cycle. When you enhance that life cycle, that's when you're altering something in that, you know, genetic of that plant that's, you know, gonna make it trip out or when you're smoking it, it's not gonna really be beneficial for you, you know? So, that's why we put on it. That's kind of the, the benefit of the licensed product, right? Mm -hmm. Although the price is higher, it is getting tested for these pesticides. Because if we're getting it on the street or the unlicensed grow, this, these exotics look the way they do because they're being enhanced by all kinds of stuff that's going through the growing process. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. So pump it up and make it grow fast. Uh, yeah, so good. which is called like bossalod or like PGRs and so forth. You know, and the plant produces its own natural PGR, you know, but then when you add that chemical, that chemical uh, PGR to it, that's when you're doing something you shouldn't be. And you said, what you said earlier about the legal side, is that is the benefits about it, because you actually know exactly what's being put in you. Yeah. You know, so, um, 
that is the benefits about it. And the crazy thing you just talked about that, it's also like that in our body inside of our endocannabinoid system. We already produce cannabinoids inside of our body, so when we're smoking and consuming cannabis, we are replenishing our body. We have an endocannabinoid system, the CD receiver. There, it's always been five systems in the in the body. We know the five systems. Your circulatory system, your what, what are they? Help me out. Respiratory, respiratory system, system, your nervous, your nervous system, right? So that's three. But the sixth system is your endocannabinoid system, and this is what the human, like the uh, the Western world, is just starting to unveil very, very slowly. But ancient. We knew this. We have a, a, a question out in the, in the, in the ethers. Yes, we got a question from uh, from Instagram from Mario Louise Rose. Sorry, butchered that. Uh, how do you manage a grow op? Well, I manage a grow op just simply by it came with experience. You know, I didn't have like the power or like you know the backing to really like have a lot of workers. But when I started off with one employee, you know, uh, working in a previous grow spot. Give me the experience to know exactly how to communicate with them, how to, you know, schedule the timing, how, what was the plant life cycle, like, you know, they say you should do certain things with the leafing on these days and stuff, but I do it exactly what the plant tells me to do, you know, so, like, when I manage to grow up and I start getting more employees and start getting more spots, it's really just like any other job that you're passionate about that you want to make good money, you want to have a high position, you got to put time behind it, you got to, when you go home, you don't just stop thinking about it, like, I think about it all the time, you know, so then, um, the way I was able to start managing it now, they gave me the responsibility, and I got it just for a year now I manage about like six to eight people but like I do that by knowing exactly what needs to get taken care of on certain days and also by planning out my schedule five months ahead of time knowing what I have I manage like seven rooms that harvest every two weeks so I now I got to know exactly like seven five months out ahead of time you know if my employees got a schedule if I got a schedule you know let them know, let them know ahead of time let me know ahead of time so it's just all about effective those SOPs will change the game, right? Your, your standard operating procedure, you, and you gotta have them. That is the secret sauce for a grow, right? That's what you know, that's your trade secret. I wanted to just uh, talk about the indica versus sativa thing, you know, because, you, you know, when you go in the store, what you, what you, you're gonna get a fire indica or something, you know, I like the OG, or I want some, how many of us smoke sativa? Or how many of us smoke indica? It just depends on what time I get. There's a reason behind this and we need to know. Let's talk about it. Come on, bro, talk to me, bro. Yeah, I mean, for me, like, it's, it's a good thing about the legal side that they actually tell people what's in the sativa. You know, for me, like, being on the managerial side, the business side, and the consulting side, I'm moving around nonstop six days a week. So, like, for me, I'm going to be smoking on a hybrid sativa dominant or a sativa. It's going to give me, like, that euphoric sensational feeling. You know, if it's 11 p.m., just finish all my things for the day, I'm just trying to relax, watch a movie, go to sleep, I'm going to smoke that in so for sure, you know? So, like, I'm going to, so if I'm smoking, you know, get in that nice little mood, that vibe, and I'm going to go to sleep, eat my dinner, go to sleep, wake up feeling amazing. So it just, like you said, it depends on the time of day, but preferably, you know, I'm up for most of the day and stuff, I'm smoking on a speaker or a hybrid to keep it down. But I'm going to throw a monkey wrench in the game, okay? That's, that's the bud that we got from the old world. Now, she has a grow, too. Y'all grow in the same genetics. Could it be possible that your indica and her indica have different profiles? Definitely. So, here's my point. I brought, I set it up. <laughs> indica and sativa really don't mean nothing anymore. They're a point of reference for us, right? We can, we can trace it down to uh, a genealogy, kind of like, oh, this is this part of this family. But when you, everybody's cloning. Everybody's cloning and crossbreeding and cross genetics and, and so now, like if you if you just you gotta go down the, the family tree of weed because you can say dosy dose, right? And you look at dosy dose and dosy dose is a cross of cherry pie and something else, and then you look at cherry pie and cherry pie is a cross of you understand where I'm going with it? So the names come from the growers. They make them like they made them. And it's great when we got into the Zaza world. That changed the game. Those is going for like four and five thousand dollars a pound. It's just ridiculous. It's just crazy. But the point is, is that that was just marketing and branding that changed the game on it. 
that was the marketing of the branding. But the science behind like the indica versus the people, it's all hybrid at this point. There are some strands that are leaning heavy or leaning heavy this way, but you can't just shop specific to strand. You have to know where it's growing. Because when you know where it's growing, you understand their SOPs, you know what growing needs that they may be using, you know what, what you call them, P, P, PR, what you call it? PGR. PGR, you know what they, you know how they're feeding their plants. And all of that creates the profile on that COA, that certificate analysis. So I challenge you when you go in the store, look at the certificate analysis and start understanding your terpene profile, understand what the terpenes really mean, understand what mercine is and limonene and all these different things because Everything that grows on the planet has a terpene profile. So it's not new science. You're not creating anything. This is not like, oh, I was high one night. This is the science that they've been hiding from us. Go ahead, sis. Well, I, I was saying that's the thing I think is so much more important versus if they're coming to Ziva, because a lot of times they think that you have to do more than four plant growth, and that's four or twelve. And um, the terpene profile, with legalization, being the COA, you have so much Cultivation is concerned, what kind of impact does it have on the environment? 
because he doesn't draw an industry and he usually we say any drawing industry uh, still have some kind of effect on the environment one way or another. That's huge. Go ahead, I'll let you go. Yeah, um, I think environmental wise, like I know with outdoor cultivation, I'm not too familiar with that because I do indoor cultivation. But I know it's a lot of regulations and stuff. They have to like the wastewater. They have to make sure it goes to a certain area and stuff like that. But I know that's definitely heavily enforced. And, you know, uh, and indoor wise, you know, we have like a separate waste that goes you know, into like sewer, uh, whatever it is. I'm not a plumber personally, but I know like we do pay attention to those aspects. Uh, I know light wise, you know, it's high pressure sodium lights that are being used. But I know they're about to be outlawed in about the next two three years. Everyone's transitioning to LED. So at our facility, we use nothing but LED lights. So it uses less energy, uh, less energy power, you know. So it's not going to be that much consumption being used. We're not going to have any energy crisis and stuff like that. Because a lot of cultivation spots are popping up. Some are using HPS lights right now. So that is that whole issue. But I mean, as far as you know, um, environmental wise, I don't think indoor cultivation will have too much of a dramatic effect on that. It's more so with the outdoor cultivation. Um, and you know, I think I think they're doing a good job enforcing certain aspects of outdoor. Okay. So there's so more of the indoor uh, cultivation that will probably be more of the focus, the best focus. Um, I would challenge that. I would actually challenge that. Uh, so I just think about California. We are an export cannabis state. We have always been the export cannabis and we'll always be for as long as I can see right now. But think about Kansas. Like Kansas. You ever been to Kansas? I never been to Kansas. <laughs> but I just say that because it's in, the, it's in the Bible, though. How about this? We grow, my family has a, a, a farm in, in Oklahoma, okay? So we're growing in Oklahoma. We got five acres in Oklahoma, right? Yeah. We're growing out there. We can't grow outdoors because the, the weather's different. Obviously, you can see that part, the, 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 the humidity, the, the environment is just totally different. So summertime there, summertime here is different. Springtime, winter, all of these different seasons have an effect on it. We're going indoor, right, in a, in a shipping container. We have to get the room acclimated to special technology to maintain the environment inside to be independent of the environment outside. That was a whole scientific experiment. But my point was is this. In those areas like that, you will see higher use of indoor grow. Without the mandate of LED light, the carbon footprint goes up considerably, almost to the point that it is harmful for the planet. So that's why you started to see legislation around LED power, because that's one of the bigger issues. One of the other big issues in the legacy market was the waste runoff, the water runoff. That is a huge issue. If you don't want to touch the plant, Start you a waste removal business. Don't get the cannabis matter from him. He's got a lot of it. And take it and dispose of it. There are, can there are companies that just do that. You know, like, uh, for point of reference, there's, I ain't even gonna say that because we're on camera. Uh, <laughs> but uh, go ahead. Well, I was gonna say, uh, I think something that environmental issues, the industry needs to really think about is packaging. Specifically with like child food packaging, and there's been a lot of iterations in the last couple of years, but there's just a lot of plastic waste right now that I think I know what people are you know, paying attention to, but that I think is a big environmental factor that we need to think about. Specifically, like in the legacy market, there's things you could go back to dispensary with like your, your glass jar and things like that, but now it's like if you're a regular user uh, or consumer, I should say, you end up with a lot, a lot of plastic. They got rid of the exit bags, but that's crazy, but um, that's something that I'm actually paying attention to. And also, I know there's some issues with um, the amount of water. People are concerned about that. Yeah, and, and I'd say it poses great ancillary market uh, opportunities for entrepreneurship, right? Um, because things are changing, and most of the companies don't know the options. I know in our micro facility, we don't have enough power. So if there was another solar solution of how we could get, they're not going to open up the grid for another two years. So it limits what we're going to be able to do. But if there are, are, are environmental solutions, I can tell you most operators that I know would be interested because we do, when you're applying for licenses, you have to have a community benefits plan. 
um, and you would be looked upon more favorably if you had an environmentally sustainable practices within your facilities. But if we don't know to ask where it's not mandated, you know, but it presents this opportunity even from the packaging perspective. If I had a salesman coming to me saying, listen, for your brand, you could really use this. It looks just as good, but now you can put on your packaging that it's environmentally friendly or recyclable. Those are selling points to the greater community that is conscious of it. So once again, we are starting at the ground floor, but it gives opportunities for us as creative people to come up with ways to utilize our skill sets that we already do on a nine to five and create a brand new lane of consulting and then eventually implementation because people have to write these things in their plans. You gotta go in front of neighborhood council. You gotta go to a public hearing for your annual licenses. People think they're fooling around with these temporary approvals where you don't have all these hoops, but eventually the state is gonna make you have an annual license and those times you have to go in front of the public. So if I had somebody telling me a plan of how I could recycle or be more sustainable in my practices, I would win right now by getting that information and it's in the open market because we just don't know how to utilize those um, systems in our operations, um, but it would be very worthwhile and lucrative. And, and an opportunity for us to get civically engaged because some of the policies don't really speak to all of the possibilities in Canada. The plant is 100% recyclable. This brother right here is sitting on with a, uh, I'm sorry, no. that's a hip t-shirt. It don't look no different than any other shirts in here. It looks better. That's his brand, you know? So we have, so what you guys are sitting on, it could be made out of him. Hemp goes further, it bends stronger, it stretches longer, you get, it's just so much more useful. But because of the broken policies, we can't utilize his fibers to make his shirt. You have to use hemp which has this 0 0.3 legal, and they're talking about raising it to 1.1% in some markets, and think about that. You got him in this city, it's 0 0.3, you go across state line and it's no longer him, now it's cannabis. These, the laws have to change, so that's why we need you guys to be educated, right? So you can help us, and we can help you get in. That's what this is all about right here. Um, and yeah, I was, I made a shameful plug for you, I was going to throw it to you on that one, but I said it because of my <laughs> There was another question out there. Oh, yes, for the bulk of the growers, and I was, since you said that you're going, the future is going more towards LED lighting, has anybody started thinking about battery operating system, like now that we have like recharger, charging stations, and lithium ion? Because I work for a battery company, and just the, the pros and cons of, of lithium ion. Has that been something that's being looked into, or is it so cheap in electricity with LED that it doesn't matter? Not that, I, not that I personally know of, but let me ask you a question. Based on the batteries, how long could it power the light for? Uh, for like a 700 watt light? So you have, you have, you have, you have, you have a different 48D, uh, 50D, and so, like say, if it, if it would take more runs of Tesla, but you have a recharging station, it really wouldn't matter because it would recharge for batteries. Oh, so you're saying you could use a rechargeable battery in there with the charging station there. But let me ask you this. If, if I have about 100 lights in a room, and if I have to individually go to each one to take out the battery to recharge it and then put it back on, that would create a little bit of a hassle and inconvenience right there. So I would say, like, if there's somewhere, like, if, if it's battery operated and while it's off, the device can recharge it at the same time. And then when it comes on, then it's using that whole thing, you know, and then it's this uh, recycling process like that. That's something that could definitely work. I don't think anybody is really looking at it in the campus industry. I just didn't know if it was possible or if it doesn't really make sense because electricity is because LED is cheaper. Or if, like, I was if you, if, if I'm telling you, I, me personally, I don't know anyone doing that. So you might have a head start, and you should, you know, take yeah, take the initiative to go to go about it and create something like that because this, this cannabis market is in its infant stages. You know, they're, they're coming out with the simplest thing after like hundreds of years of hand water. They just came out with a system like that just used like any sprinkler system in front of a home. That they just came up with an automation system, you know, and like I'm only been, I learned that after only being in the industry for four years, while other people longer than me didn't even know anything about it. You know, so it's like if you're coming out with that idea, go ahead and explore that, you know, and see. And then when you have that and present it to a, to a licensed shop or a cultivation place and be like, hey, you know, I got these, you don't have to use, you don't have to use electricity anymore. You have to pay for Battery, they last you for like a year, or you know, they charge overnight and they're good for like two years or something like that. I'm telling you, 
don't, the owners will do that because then you're saving us a whole lot of money on electricity and it's environmentally better. That's powerful. I want to get to your question. Is it is really because I want to make a point? Um, Dr. Rod, I was a little confused when you said that the like yours, that the grid's not opening up more than a few years or something like that. So basically, uh, you can actually get no cost solar now and then get the storage battery as well. The storage battery can actually power uh, enough electricity for a minimum of eight hours and upwards to about 18 hours, let's say if there's a blackout. That would cost, I mean, that would actually save you a tremendous amount. Plus, if you're getting it as far as a no cost with some of the government sponsored programs, that means you're looking at a tiny affordable one with payment to your arms or able to write off of your taxes as a business. I wonder is that would they do that if you're leasing, or is that for the owners of the property? Um, no, I mean, you can also you can lease the panels as well, same, pretty much same deal. Well, let's talk about not the panels itself, but the property. The, pro the property itself. The property, it is the property. The only thing there that needs to be done is whoever owns the property, that title holder, is the main person that I would normally need to speak with whenever it comes to me because you're going to get there. That's what I was thinking because usually when I go into Home Depot, they say, Are you a homeowner? That's why I was like, Well, I'm a business owner, but like, uh, but I, I lease the building, so I get it. No. But I mean, to his point, and, the, and that's a Exemplary example. That's just a great example of, of, of uh, shout out to Night She Broke. Equity of War, baby. I love that. Um, but the, the ancillary opportunity, just think about those. Like, you don't have to touch the plant to be in the cannabis industry. A lot of the people that are in the cannabis industry are not plant touching businesses. You know, and so you think about the gold rush. In the gold rush, who made the most money? The people who got the the gold or the picks and shovel. You can be a pick and shovel right now. The battery, that's that's groundbreaking. I was thinking about a line of LED lights. We're talking to some uh, manufacturers about that because growing mediums. We need these type of ancillary businesses to where people need to patronize you and they, it's not because, like right now, we don't go to keep the shop because she don't have a fire. But there's a certain level of, we don't go there because it's a black woman. We don't go there because it's a social equity store. We don't go there because we want to support. Capitalism don't care what you look like. We want to get in the mix of normal business. That's how we're going to create this generational wealth. It's not like a sympathetic damn purchase. It's a real purchase because you don't go to Amazon and say, I'm going to support a, a, a little bit. No, if you support a little business, you didn't know that you bought something from a small drop shipper. So, we got to look at it like that and get into the ancillary space on top of the license. The licenses, so think about if your ancillary opportunity is larger than going after a license. We're going to the, getting a license is almost like going to the NBA down there right now because it's only 200 people that got the damn license. So the rest of the people don't get a license. So now what? It's over? It's not. Honestly, it's a risk reward. Players have the most risk of getting injured because they make the most money, but the guy who's selling the concession is probably making a lot of money too. <laughs> Jerry Jones is, he owns the concessions at his stadium, mm -hmm. but he also runs the Ram Stadium hospitality because he has an ancillary business. He's not just the owner of the cow. You know what I'm saying? We got to think about it like that. Follow the money, y'all. And that's what makes it an industry. You know, yes. it's not just people trying to get high or, you know, sell products. Like a cool industry that's gonna like become a legacy. We're gonna take the legacy market and make it true legacy. Uh, so I think that's and this, these types of conversations are important in like building this industry to make sure it's sustainable and that we are like at the head of the seat of the table. Another question this point. Um, kind of circling back to anti recidivism, like what are are there any organizations or specific pathways that are targeting One organization that pops to mind immediately, they're local too, is the uh, is LARP, Los Angeles Reentry Recidivism. I can't I can't think of the whole name, but it's LARP, and they specifically work with uh, the population that is reentering 
that is one of the hardest things to do. And recidivism is high. The rates is, you know, 90% plus. The chances of you getting out of jail, you're going to go back. The chances of you going back is 90%. And that's crazy. And if you're in jail for cannabis, that's even crazier. So uh, there, I don't think there can be enough work being done because there's still people in jail. Shouts out to Corbin Cooper. He got out the same time that Hario got out. And we met Hario here. He came over here uh, we was doing an event. But Dante West, there's so many people still in jail that the work still needs to be done. Like recidivism is one thing, getting out and being able to, every criminal has to deal with that. But when you think about people in jail for cannabis and Mad Men and what we're doing right now, like we should just really stop and just go get them home. We should go pick them up. So that's, I think that also is about the data stigma that's always out there with cannabis. Say there's people, you see the news that are murdered by the police and some of their excuses is, oh, I smell cannabis. So that being a dangerous person. Um, so again, redefining like what it means to be a cannabis user and consumer and like what this, the benefits of the plant brings, I think is also really important as part of that political conversation um, to for people to understand, this is a, a legitimate industry, just like the, the alcohol industry, which, in my opinion, is much more dangerous to cannabis. And I think we have to, uh, you know, <laughs> yeah, to, to prove that. Um, but just, and also it's important with social equity expungement of cannabis records, making sure that when the states go legal, that we're looking at these things so that people like Magman don't come in and make billions of dollars and for all the same thing where there's people rotting in jail off of the government. I think it's an important part of the conversation. Well, here goes my call out to the community again, because the equity provisions exist, right? We, Y'all, they're not going to give us no handouts. If it's in the law, we got to milk it. So there's a social equity workers mandate in the city of L.A. in particular. If it's not in your city, we need to make sure I talk about being grassroots lobbyists, that we stand on these positions and we can use L.A. at least as a precedence of the policies that are in place. So if you're a social equity worker, that means you're an ex-felon, you've previously been incarcerated, you're on government assistance, you live in an economically disadvantaged area, if you're in LA, South Central LA, um, you're chronically unemployed, you're homeless. That considers you a social worker, a social equity worker, or a transitional worker. In the city of LA, all license holders have a 10% hire. They must hire you if you fall in one of those categories talking about recidivism and we're talking about programs that exist what's not happening is the programs that exist that are working and placing folks in jobs they don't know about these regulations right because they should be applying pressure across the board cultivation distribution testing every single license type if you have a temporary approval in the city of LA you are supposed to have a 10 percent higher if you're a social equity license holder there are about to be 200 retail stores social equity lining up we have a 50% social equity hire. So what's not there are the programs that say, hey, we're gonna prepare you for the next two weeks to learn the POS systems in order to work in the retail dispensaries. We're gonna teach you how to do trimming so you can take the entry level job in his um, cultivation facility. So what's lacking is the community effort tying in the fact that this is a mandate and there's people in our community that could be working right now at living wage jobs if in fact we properly prepare them and then press these license holders and the city to implement a program that was already in place in 2017, y'all. Um, so once again, the purpose, why I'm always here and always speaking is to motivate us to be actively engaged, understand all these elements, and guess what? It all starts in the regulations. What I'm talking about is in the regulations loud and clear. So you know that if you're a business owner, you gotta know who you better start working with in the hood of who you're going to properly prepare, start training them now before you open your doors, right? And if not, if you're a member of the community, know these are the things that we should push because this is what closes the economic wealth gap. When we have living wage jobs to provide for our family, we are more inclined to be invest in our communities. And so, um, yes, to answer your questions, the laws exist. We just haven't pushed them and applied pressure to implement them as of yet. And we got to get you guys to help us because we apply the pressure. Every neighborhood council is to make a community impact statement at the city council, right? 
And this community impacts that they get a lot of time. If you look at the key, uh, the, uh, the 15 districts and that council meeting in Los Angeles, if you look at that agenda, you'll see who's making community impact statements on what. Most of the time, the community impact statements are made by people lobbying those neighborhood councils to get behind things that they want to do in the community. Oftentimes, developments. Oftentimes, things that they, businesses that they want to start. We have to utilize that same funnel because the neighborhood council has a strong voice in the city council. You know, that shows that constituents are concerned. If you're tapping into the neighborhood council, you're a voter. You, you might have sway a vote. You, so they care about those things. The squeaky wheel always gets the attention is what my sister always likes to say. So we need your help at the city council meeting, at the cannabis commission meeting, at the neighborhood council meeting. We have to go in there educated and know how to speak on behalf of these policies, right? Oftentimes, the people that are lobbying are folks who are in direct benefit. Social equity is a direct benefit of our community. We are all lobbyists. She says you're a grassroots lobbyist. I got any lobbyists in the house? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Only like two or three, so <laughs> two, you know what I'm saying? We need you guys. It's so important to be able to take the education, the love for cannabis, your 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 your, your pursuit of happiness and, and, and liberty, right? You want to make money as a business. Tie all that together with your advocacy work, with your lobbying, to these government officials speak truth to power because you've read the regulations. So you understand what the law is and you can hold them accountable. Part of the mandate was a community reinvestment. These companies that paid over $330 million into tax revenue, imagine what they made. That's, that's billions of dollars right there that they made. They paid $330 million three years. So, and they have a community reinvestment plan that's not being enforced, right? So we need your help. They also just approved a grant, finally. They've approved up to $20 million worth of grant money. How much of that has actually made it down to actual equity applicants? They spent $250,000 so far. They just allocated another $2 million, and I, I, I applied today for the grant. You know, uh, it's for retail operators in Los Angeles. We're, we're almost four years into this, three, three years into this. We haven't got that resource. And, and it's because it's hard to hold them accountable when we're not at the table all the time, right? But you, it's hard to get a seat at the table if, if, if we don't really know what to say. There's no worse way to, and I'm going to leave the end on this one, there's no worse way to, to waste money, right, than to have an attorney and not know what to ask your attorney. You're paying this person, and you don't know the right questions to ask. That is a waste of money, and you you get around that by starting with the regulation. Because I can, every attorney that I talked to had to get back to me. Why? <laughs> so you can go read the regulations, and then we can talk. So get on the playing field with us, and then you can get in the rooms with anybody and square it off. You can put Keith in any room with any politician in America. My sister go represent. I feel the same way about myself. That's my sister right there. So, it, it, it took the education, it took just the reading, getting passionate, and getting very intentional on where we're going. So to just, if you think about you want to get in the cannabis space, you got to start with where you're going to go, what you're going to do when it's going to start with, with reading those regulations and understanding them. Because there, there are some steps, but they're like broad steps. They ain't, getting, they ain't always detailed as we need to be until you get to that fine print. So, I just want to encourage you all that we're at the beginning of this. We're literally, uh, somebody told me, uh, pre uh, uh, cannabis, uh, it was like 1932. This is like right there at that moment of alcohol prohibition. We're right here again. History is repeating itself. And there's a great documentary that uh, our beloved brother, uh, Nazi was known to do called Smoke. Got to check that out. It's called Smoke. BBT collaborated with them. They put it out and took it back in. So whenever they say you want to hear it again, consume it because it's one of the realest things that, that I've seen produced on cannabis. Uh, talking about the history and all the way up. But he said, right now, 
We always say, I said it, I know some of you guys are saying you're passionate like I am. Um, what would you have done if you was in a civil rights movement? You was there in the 60s with, with those with strong brothers and sisters out there standing in line. What would you have done? Who would have been your position? I just want to wake your ass up today. You're still in the middle of the civil rights movement, and the question remains not what you would have done, it's what are you going to do? Come on. So again, I'm DJ Quest Coast. Uh, I'm a social equity retail operator right here in West Adams, uh, on between Hobbs and Redondo. I'll be right there by Delicious Pizza. I started the West Adams block party right there. And so uh, in front of my store, man, it's just coming together. God is working, bro. Right? God is working. He told me that earlier because it's, it's just so true. It's, it's coming together. And I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm an advocate for us in our community in this cannabis plant. Uh, I'm the founder of Papa Canada. We're going to elevate the cannabis experience. You know, uh, I'm, I'm available for consultants as well. I come from the media space. So as, as, as a media company, my, my, my original production company is called Elevate Culture Presents. And that's what I've been doing. I help with the Juneteenth celebrations and a lot of the activations here in the city, I mean, in, in the village, and all around different festivals. But now it's seed to sell India. And we're going to talk about cannabis, and we're going to make sure that these these type of stories are heard and seen. And shout out to my brother Raven just walking in because he's also, give, give him a round of applause, because he's also a social angel in the city. And that's my brother. Thank you for being here. Uh, I want to just walk back through and let everybody know just the word out there, people here who just walking in. Let us know who you are. Uh, well, let's start with you, Tiana. Hi, I'm Tiana Jones. I represent Canada Houston. Um, just wanted to shout out. That. that is a base of over 800 POC uh, operated and run Canada companies. Um, like plant testing, the anecdotal If you want to know, you want to go and uh, help a POC run cannabis company, check out the inclusive base. You can find that on our website, cannabis.com. We also have the accountability list. I think it has important is to hold like, our local uh, leaders accountable. It's important to hold these companies accountable too. So if you have a favorite brand, Look up to our accountability list, um, and if you have questions about what they are or aren't doing, don't be afraid to hit them up. And then I'm also co-host of a podcast called Highly Political. It's a podcast where two chicks get high, talk politics, laugh, and sometimes cry. <laughs> um, you can find us anywhere that you listen to podcasts. And on Instagram, we're at highly underscore political. And you can find me uh, at Stony Jones on Instagram. Stony Jones, I like that. If I was a boy, my name would be the Biff or Stoney? I thought, I thought Stoney sounded cooler. And yeah, I agree. Yeah, Stoney's always been my agent, but it's just a happy question that I always love cannabis. But Biff sounds rich. I don't know. But Tiana is too. I love that. Thank you for being here, Tiana. I appreciate it. Brother? Um, my name is David Kateri. I'm uh, a master grower at the dispensary Smartweed, located in uh, Melrose, Hollywood area. Short and sweet, the man got a master dream, so that's what he did, you know, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> Thank you for being here, brother, sister. Uh, well, I'm known as Big Kika, because I have a 27-year-old that's Lil Kika. So my, <laughs> my Instagram is um, at Big Kika. Um, check us out. We'll be opening soft launch on Juneteenth, right at 4233 Crenshaw Boulevard, our all-encompassing wellness center, Gorilla RX. Wellness Co. next to Mavericks Flat. We plan on having the largest supply of black-owned products. We definitely want to carry yours and social equity brands in our space. Well-educated bud tenders that will take you through our 6,000-plus SKUs. We like to say Whole Foods meets GNC, where you really have an opportunity, no matter where you're at in the process, find something to introduce you to. If you're Canada Curious or if you're the Canada Connoisseurs, we will have the top of the top brands in there. Um, and, and have just a really good experience going through. Um, and then I, I see most importantly is our community work, um, Life Development Group and the Social Equity Owners and Workers Association. Um, we are working hard to raise funds right next door to us. Used to be LA Cannabis Co. I don't know if you all noticed back in 2019, 
the boycotting that was going on in that dispensary next door to us because it was some Armenian folks that came in and moved next to us, which would have knocked us out. Um, they were in the community for 10 years. They never hired in our community. They never gave back in our community, so the community showed out. But it is a fully functional, brand new dispensary, and we hope to have a program for re-entry and for the community where we're training a mock dispensary. So you'll get the training to either funnel into our nice dispensary or be able to go out to the greater community. Um, but that is our effort to acquire that um, and next year have that fully going. So when we talk about, I hate just talking about the problems because there's plenty of them. We need to know it so that we know that it's important to fight for it. Um, but we also must be responsible for creating the solutions. So my good old team, Ignite, is one of them. We have a good crew um, of folks for the past few years. Um, we've been moving and mobilizing, creating training materials from the start to the finish, and we welcome you all to be a part of it. Uh, come on board at lifedevelopmentgroup.org um, or hit me up on uh, <laughs> Ignite is <laughs> pointing to equity or war. That's our little banner. Um, and we say war in the sense of a sustained effort to make sure that we win the war, because it is a war against us, as we all know, and black people in particular. Um, and if we don't take it that seriously, we will be left behind. So I look forward to everybody joining up, because it will take a collective effort. Thanks for having me. Hey, well, they, uh, thank you so much. Yeah. Where can they find you at? Drop a handle if you want to get in. Yeah, my Instagram is at is Mr. Dot Ghost underscore Society. And uh, the dispensary is Smartweed. You can Smartweed LA. And where our address is 1040 Northwestern Avenue, it's the end of California, 90029. Well, let's start. Is it just the I? Yes, Stoney Jones, or at highly underscore political, or can't please And Absolutely. can I give, just give a shout out to Soul Folks? Because this is amazing to be able to be in the community and share this information and feel good and inviting and knowing that we're in a safe, meaningful space. So I just wanted to give a shout out. Yeah, big yeah. shout out to the whole entire Soul Folks. Yes, yes. We appreciate you for having us. Uh, this is a wonderful cannabis and cash conversation. I mean, this is a cash crop, y'all. You got to get in where we fit in, and uh, it ain't going to happen unless we read. So I appreciate you all being here. You can follow me at a DJ Call Quest, like a Tribe Call Quest, a DJ Call Quest, or you can follow Papa Cam. And uh, let's, let's do this, y'all. Let's elevate cannabis. Oh, shit. <laughs> Thank you.